Lesson 2 Signs of Divinity Sabbath Afternoon October 5 Was the human nature of the Son of Mary changed into the divine nature of the Son of God? No, the two natures were mysteriously blended in one person, the man Christ Jesus. In him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When Christ was crucified, it was his human nature that died. Deity did not sink and die. That would have been impossible. Christ, the sinless one, will save every son and daughter of Adam who accepts the salvation proffered them, consenting to become the children of God. The Savior has purchased the fallen race with his own blood. This is a great mystery a mystery that will not be fully completely understood in all its greatness until the translation of the redeemed shall take place. Then the power and greatness and efficacy of the gift of God to man will be understood. But the enemy is determined that this gift shall be so mystified that it will become as nothingness. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1113. Those who had an appreciation of the character and mission of Christ were filled with reverence and awe as they looked upon him and felt that they were looking upon the temple of the living God. Officers were sent to take the Son of God that the temple in which God was enshrined might be destroyed. But as they drew near and heard the words of divine wisdom that fell from his lips, they were charmed, and the power and excellence of his instruction so filled their hearts and minds that they forgot the purpose for which they had been sent. Christ revealed himself to their souls, divinity flashed through humanity, and they returned so filled with this one thought, so charmed with the ideas he had presented, that when the leaders of Israel inquired, why have ye not brought him? They replied, Never man spake like this man. They had seen that which priests and rulers would not see. Humanity flooded with the light and glory of divinity. Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890, paragraph 9. When he was upon earth, Jesus said to those who refused him, Ye will not come unto me that ye might have life. There are many who are refusing to respond to the drawing love of Christ today. Jesus calls, but many refuse to respond to the invitation. They will not avail themselves of the privilege of having Jesus for their personal Savior. They do not come in humility and faith that they may know by a personal experience what they are to Jesus and what He is to them. But the promise is, He shall see of the travail of His soul and shall be satisfied. Jesus will not rest until he leads his followers unto the realms of perfect joy and glory. Signs of the Times, February 27, 1893, paragraph 5. Sunday, October 6. The Feeding of the Five Thousand. The Passover was at hand, and from far and near, bands of pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem gathered to see Jesus. Additions were made to their number until there were assembled five thousand men besides women and children. Before Christ reached the shore, a multitude were waiting for him. But he landed unobserved by them and spent a little time apart with the disciples. From the hillside he looked upon the moving multitude and his heart was stirred with sympathy. Interrupted as he was and robbed of his rest, he was not impatient. He saw a greater necessity demanding his attention as he watched the people coming and still coming. He was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. They received no help from the priests and rulers, but the healing waters of life flowed from Christ as he taught the multitude the way of salvation. The Desire of Ages, page 364. I was directed to the power of God manifested through Moses when the Lord sent him in before Pharaoh. Satan understood his business and was upon the ground. He well knew that Moses was chosen of God to break the yoke of bondage upon the children of Israel and that he and his work prefigured Christ's first advent to break Satan's power over the human family and deliver those who were made captives by his power. 
Satan knew that when Christ should appear, mighty works and miracles would be wrought by him, that the world might know that the Father had sent him. He trembled for his power. He consults with his angels to accomplish a work which shall answer a twofold purpose. One, to destroy the influence of the work wrought by God through his servant Moses by working through his agents and thus counterfeiting the true work of God. Two, the influence of his work through the magicians would reach down through all ages and would destroy in the minds of many true faith in the mighty miracles and works of Christ, which would be performed by him when he should come to this world. He knew that his kingdom would suffer, for the power which he held over mankind would be subject to Christ. It was no human influence or power Moses possessed which wrought on the minds that produced those miracles before Pharaoh. It was the power of God. These signs and wonders were wrought through Moses to convince Pharaoh that the great I Am sent him to command Pharaoh to let Israel go, that they might serve him. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4b, page 81 Christ made satisfaction for the guilt of the whole world, and all who will come to God in faith will receive the righteousness of Christ, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 Our sin has been expiated, put away, cast into the depths of the sea. Through repentance and faith, we are rid of sin and look unto the Lord our righteousness. Jesus suffered the just for the unjust. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 392. Monday, October 7. Surely he is the prophet. Seated upon the grassy plain in the twilight of the spring evening, the people ate of the food that Christ had provided. No human power could create from five barley loaves and two small fishes food sufficient to feed thousands of hungry people. And they said one to another, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. John chapter 6 verse 14. He can conquer the nations and give to Israel the long-sought dominion. In their enthusiasm, the people are ready at once to crown him king. They see that he makes no effort to attract attention or secure honor to himself. They fear that he will never urge his claim to David's throne. Consulting together, they agree to take him by force and proclaim him the king of Israel. Jesus sees what is on foot and understands, as they cannot, what would be the result of such a movement. Jesus now commands the multitude to disperse, and his manner is so decisive that they dare not disobey. The kingly bearing of Jesus and his few quiet words of command quell the tumult and frustrate their designs. They recognize in him a power above all earthly authority, and without a question, they submit. God's Amazing Grace, page 46. Jesus said of the Old Testament scriptures, and how much more it is true of the new, they are they which testify of me. John chapter 5 verse 39. If you would become acquainted with the Savior, study the holy scriptures, fill the whole heart with the words of God. They are the living water quenching your burning thirst. They are the living bread from heaven. Our bodies are built up from what we eat and drink, and as in the natural economy, so in the spiritual economy. It is what we meditate upon that will give tone and strength to our spiritual nature. Spiritual life must be sustained by communion with Christ through His Word. The mind must dwell upon it. The heart must be filled with it. The Word of God laid up in the heart and sacredly cherished and obeyed through the power of the grace of Christ can make man right and keep him right. God's Amazing Grace, page 228 Jesus did not gratify their curiosity. He sadly said, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. They did not seek him from any worthy motive, but as they had been fed with the loaves, they hoped still to receive temporal benefit by attaching themselves to him. The Savior bade them, 
Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Seek not merely for material benefit. Let it not be the chief effort to provide for the life that now is, but seek for spiritual food, even that wisdom which will endure unto everlasting life. This the Son of God alone can give, for him hath God the Father sealed. The Desire of Ages, page 384. Tuesday, October 8. The Healing of the Blind Man, Part 1. Job was sorely afflicted, and his friends sought to make him acknowledge that his suffering was the result of sin and cause him to feel under condemnation. They represented his case as that of a great sinner, but the Lord rebuked them for their judgment of his faithful servant. There is wickedness in our world, but all the suffering is not the result of a perverted course of life. Job is brought distinctly before us as a man whom the Lord allowed Satan to afflict. The enemy stripped him of all he possessed. His family ties were broken. His children were taken from him. For a time his body was covered with loathsome sores, and he suffered greatly. His friends came to comfort him, but they tried to make him see that he was responsible by his sinful course for his afflictions. But he defended himself and denied the charge, declaring, Miserable comforters are ye all. By seeking to make him guilty before God and deserving of his punishment, they brought a grievous test upon him and represented God in a false light. But Job did not swerve from his loyalty, and God rewarded his faithful servant. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 3, page 1140. Christ came to reveal to the world the knowledge of the character of God. The truth of God had been hidden beneath a mass of tradition and error. The sacrificial offerings which had been instituted to teach men concerning the vicarious atonement of Christ, to teach them that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins, had become to them a stumbling block. All that was spiritual and holy was perverted to their darkened understanding. They were blinded by pride and prejudice so that they could not see to the end of that which was abolished. Jesus came to change the order of things that then existed and reveal to them the character of the Father. The Review and Herald, November 1, 1892, paragraph 12. Not infrequently the minds of even God's servants are so blinded by tradition and false teaching that they only partially grasp the things revealed in His Word. The disciples of Christ, even when the Savior was with them, had the popular conception of the Messiah as a temporal prince who was to exalt Israel to universal empire. They could not understand His words for telling His suffering and death. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples on the way to Emmaus and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. It was his purpose to fasten their faith upon the sure word of prophecy, Luke chapter 24 verse 27 and 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 19. Not merely by his personal testimony, but by the prophecies of the Old Testament. And as the very first step in imparting this knowledge, Jesus directed the disciples to Moses and all the prophets of the Old Testament scriptures. From here to forever, pages 215 and 217. Wednesday, October 9. The Healing of the Blind Man, Part 2. The miracles Christ performed on the Sabbath were all for the relief of the afflicted, but the Pharisees had sought to condemn him as a Sabbath-breaker. They had tried to arouse the Herodians against him. They represented that he was seeking to set up a rival kingdom and consulted with them how to destroy him. To excite the Romans against him, they had represented him as trying to subvert their authority. They had tried every pretext to cut him off from influencing the people. But so far their attempts had been foiled. The multitudes who witnessed his works of mercy and heard his pure and holy teachings knew that these were not the deeds and words of a Sabbath-breaker or blasphemer. Even the officers sent by the Pharisees had been so influenced by his words that they could not lay hands on him. 
In desperation, the Jews had finally passed an edict that any man who professed faith in Jesus should be cast out of the synagogue. The Desire of Ages, page 538. Because of the pride and ambition of the children of men, God has chosen to perform his mighty works by the most simple and humble means. It is not the men whom the world honors as great, talented, or brilliant that God selects. He chooses those who will work in meekness and simplicity, acknowledging him as their leader and their source of strength. He would have us make him our protector and our guide in all the duties and affairs of life. The Apostle Paul could meet eloquence with eloquence, logic with logic. He could intelligently enter into all controversies. But was he satisfied with this worldly knowledge? He writes, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Ellen G. White Comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentaries, Volume 6, page 1083. Christ chose the foolish things of the world, those whom the world pronounced unlearned and ignorant, to confound the wise men of the world. The disciples were unlearned in the traditions of the rabbis, but with Christ as their example and teacher, they were gaining an education of the highest order, for they had before them a divine example. Christ was presenting to them truths of the highest character. Those whom God employs to do service for him, he would have fitted in his way for that service. Those who preach Christ must learn of Christ daily in order to understand the mystery of saving and serving the souls for whom he has died. They must pattern after him in all things, sharing his tender compassion and his sternness against all evil working. This Day with God, page 41. Thursday, October 10, The Resurrection of Lazarus Christ wept at the grave of Lazarus that he could not save everyone whom Satan's power had laid low in death. He had given himself a ransom for many, even all who would avail themselves of the privilege of coming back to their loyalty to God. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, he knew that for that life he must pay the ransom on the cross of Calvary. Every rescue made was to cause him the deepest humiliation. He was to taste death for every man. He knew that he alone could rescue them from the pit into which they had fallen. He alone could place their feet in the right path. His perfection alone could avail for their imperfection. He alone could cover their nakedness with his spotless robe of righteousness. He is strong to deliver. Help has been laid on one that is mighty. He encircles man with his long human arm, while with his divine arm he lays hold of omnipotence. Sons and Daughters of God, page 25 It was not only because of his human sympathy with Mary and Martha that Jesus wept. In his tears there was a sorrow as high above human sorrow as the heavens are higher than the earth. Christ did not weep for Lazarus for he was about to call him from the grave. He wept because many of those now mourning for Lazarus would soon plan the death of him who was the resurrection and the life. But how unable were the unbelieving Jews rightly to interpret his tears! Some, who could see nothing more than the outward circumstances of the scene before him as a cause for his grief, said softly, Behold, how he loved him! Others, seeking to drop the seed of unbelief into the hearts of those present, said derisively, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? If it were in Christ's power to save Lazarus, why then did he suffer him to die? With prophetic eye, Christ saw the enmity of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He knew that they were premeditating his death. He knew that some of those now apparently so sympathetic would soon close against themselves the door of hope and the gates of the city of God. A scene was about to take place in his humiliation and crucifixion that would result in the destruction of Jerusalem, and at that time none would make lamentation for the dead. 
The retribution that was coming upon Jerusalem was plainly portrayed before him. He saw Jerusalem compassed by the Roman legions. He knew that many now weeping for Lazarus would die in the siege of the city, and in their death there would be no hope. The Desire of Ages, pages 533 and 534. The Blessed Bible gives us a knowledge of the great plan of salvation and shows us how every individual may have eternal life. Who is the author of the book? Jesus Christ. He is the true witness, and he says to his own, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The Bible is to show us the way to Christ, and in Christ eternal life is revealed. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 308. For further reading, The Ministry of Healing, Five Small Barley Loaves Feed the Multitude, pages 45 to 50, and The Desire of Ages, Priestly Plottings, pages 537 to 542.